In the life of Esther, uh, if you're joining us for the first time in this series, uh, we were about, I think this is the third or the fourth message, and um, this little Jewish orphan girl named Esther is now the queen over the most powerful kingdom on earth at that time. And she got there through some pretty strange means. And if you'll remember one of the themes of Esther, and I'm just teaching tonight, if you came for high octane screaming and shouting and spitting, um, you'll be disappointed. I, I want to teach through these verses tonight. But one of the things that I, if, if you don't get this after we're done with the study, then I have mangled the teaching of the book of Esther, that the sovereign God of heaven is at work even when his people can't see it or feel it. That is the primary um, underlying theme of Esther, that God is always up to something on behalf of his children. And I've told you probably every, every message in the series that nowhere in the book of Esther is God's name even found one time. He's never mentioned. It's the only book in the Bible where he's not named. But his hands are everywhere. And tonight, when I read these verses, some of you are going to be like, what is he going to do with these verses? There ain't nothing on this. But this is probably actually one of the most important passages of Scripture. Because God is going to do something in this passage tonight that is going to be massively impacting in a chapter or two to come. In fact, I'll go so far as to say this. This chapter is crucial to the amazing, stunning victory at the end of the book of Esther. And when you read it, you're just like, ho-hum, just a bunch of words. There's not a whole lot of revelation on it. There's nothing clearly inspiring. But I I promise you, if you'll stick with me through this series, we're going to look back at this moment and you're going to see, oh, that's why that was important. The only reason I mention that now is because there are things going on in your life right now that don't look like God. They just look like life. They just look like nine to five. They just like look like paying the bills, raising the kids, going to church, doing your thing. They don't look like heavenly or astounding or anointed or glorious. And oftentimes we'll just cruise. And that's why a lot of people want to come to church on Sunday. And I want you to come to church on Sunday, but a lot of people show up at church on Sunday to get their spiritual hit because the rest of the week they don't feel or, or, or sense God moving anywhere. And so they get, they get crammed into a room on a Sunday with some g- great music and some help, helpful teaching and the presence of the Lord. And they're like, okay, man, I can go off of that for a few more days. I'll get back there on Tuesday and we'll pray. I'll feel it again. I'll get me another, another hit. I'll come back Wednesday. I'll get me another hit. And they're, they're event junkies at times. And so what they end up doing is they, they, they miss the fact that, no, God's actually going to be there in your kitchen when you walk in tonight. God is there at the funeral home when your heart's broken. God is, he, listen, a lot of people struggle with this, but the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, if I can sum it up, I mean, I could preach on it for two years and not fully exhaust it, but the doctrine of the sovereignty of God in its most generalized statement means God is in control. Now, that doesn't make him a puppeteer and we're just on his strings doing whatever he wants us to do because there's so many things in Scripture that tell us about our responsibility. But if God wasn't in control, then Romans 8.28 could not be true. Do you know what Romans 8.28 says? We know that God works all things together for good on behalf of those that love him and have been called according to his purpose. Meaning, are, are, are you saved? Then you are one who loves God. Are you saved? That means you're one called into his purpose. And so the statement of scripture is, God is working everything in your life for good. God even works the bad stuff for good. And if God can work the bad stuff for good, he can work the boring stuff for good, okay? Okay. So we're going to see that all throughout the study of Esther, and I'm going to read to you tonight from chapter number two. Esther 2.19, now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was being brought up by him. 
In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, look at these names, Big Fan and Teresh, they're bouncers. They're, they, they're just, well, you'll find out these are not good dudes. So Big Fan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. They wanted to kill him. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. That's actually very important. Verse 23, when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So you read those words and it just sounds like a historical footnote. It doesn't have any jazz on it. It's not like super amped. It doesn't stoke our you know, faith up. But that's the whole point of why I'm teaching it. I almost didn't teach this because it's going to force you to think, slow down, and risk being distracted. Don't get distracted. Stay right here with me. It would be years before this event we just read comes into play with a fullness of forth that changes the direction of Mordecai, Esther, and the lives of all the Jews that were living in Persia. And when we read it, again, it feels like just some commentary about an average day in the life of Mordecai who exposed two thugs that were ready to kill the king. And that's not all that's there. So I'm going to talk to you about the silent seed of providence. Providence is not a word that we use very often, um, it, it, even in churches, unless you are reformed or Calvinistic, providence doesn't get a lot of, of usage, but it's simply a word that describes God superintending his will through the normal events that are taking place on earth. Providence means that God, though he is outside of time, he's outside of space, he is not cut off from time and space. He can work within time and space. He can take normal, ordinary things and use those things to fulfill his plans. Here is a, a, an occasion where we're going to see what that looks like. And so I'm going to use the word providential a few times. And so hopefully by the end of it, if you're not familiar with these, these themes and terms, you'll get it. So the first thing we're going to see is what I call a providential location. It means that Mordecai just happened to be in the right place and the right time to overhear this conversation that in the moment doesn't seem like a big deal, but in years to come, it's going to be a massively big deal. So here's the verse. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now, it's a reference to the harem of King Ahasuerus and, and the virgins there, and we talked about that the last couple of weeks, but we're really focusing on Mordecai. Mordecai, who is himself a Jew, he is the cousin, the older cousin of Esther, who raised Esther after her parents died, and then it was him that superintended her, taught her about Yahweh, taught her anything she learned about God, and now here she is, the queen of all the land, but Mordecai still looks at her as the little girl that he raised up. And it says he's sitting there at the king's gate. It's a place of prominence. It's a place that some scholars believe is a place of authority, that somehow he probably got favor through King Esther, excuse me, Queen Esther, and it was invited to have a prominent place. But while he's there, we're going to find out there's a moment that happens. Now, why do I even bother teaching this verse? Because um, where you are matters more than you think. We are a generation, did y'all ever, was it the movie Up, the cartoon that had the dog that would be fine and then he saw a squirrel and he goes, squirrel! And it just easily, we're the squirrel generation. Like we can get distracted, we can be locked in and something happened over here and we just lose our attention. And a lot of times because um, we are used to instant everything in this generation, we don't like waiting when we can't see the action happening. And I've seen this as a pastor. I've seen it in my own heart at times. But what I've learned is God actually works through where he wants you to be. And sometimes we get froggy. 
We get tired of being where we've been. We need new, we need exciting, we need something to happen. And we move from places before God has given us permission to when it very well may have been that if we had lingered a little longer or sought his face or waited a little bit longer, even though our flesh was wanting to move to something different, we could have experienced something great in God's providential care. Mordecai is just sitting at the gate and I'm saying to you, where you are matters more than you think. God works sovereignly in our lives through placement. So I'm talking about like relocating, You'll have many opportunities in your life to relocate to a new home, to relocate to a new city, to relocate to a new job, to relocate to a new church. And guys, those are things that we need to slow down a little bit about and say, I need to know what God is saying in these moments because he had me where I've been and I need to know that I've been released from that place before I move to somewhere of my own choosing. And so God wants to give guidance. In this case, it's a much smaller thing. Mordecai is just being where he's supposed to be, which is at the king's gate, okay? So let's move on from providential location. And by the way, let me just pastor that point just a second. Sometimes God will intentionally put you in a dry place. He'll put you in a job you don't like. He'll put you in a house that you wish was better, bigger, or newer. He will put you, and I've done this, most of us in the room have been in a church season where we're like, is the Lord even here anymore? Like, it feels dry up in this place. I remember a guy telling me 15 years ago, and I was pastoring uh, in Lawrenceville, and I remember he came in and goes, hey, we're going to have to leave. And I'm like, what? What? He was part of our production team. And he's like, yeah, we're going to have to leave. He, he said, the Holy Spirit's not here anymore. And I went home and told Amy. And Amy said, well, he's supposed to bring the Holy Spirit with him. That's my prophetic wife. I'm over there sulking. And Amy's like, well, if the Holy Spirit's not there, it's because that man didn't bring him with him. So my point being is this. If, if we can't endure a dry season without having to go find our fix somewhere, whether it's church, whether it's a job, um, I, I worked at a job prior to, prior to entering ministry. I got saved and I, had, I got called four months after I got saved and I, I really thought I need to be preaching. I need to be ministering. I need to be an evangelist. I need to be a missionary. I'm sitting here in this data center loading up paper and printers and entering codes and I'm wasting my life. And it took three years. And I remember I had a bad attitude about that job for about nine months and finally, and you know, I wasn't especially prophetic at that time, or at least if it was in there, I didn't know it. But I remember hearing the Lord say to me in my spirit, he's like, I'm not letting you leave with this bad attitude because you'll take it with you wherever I send you. So I shaped up my attitude real quick. And within uh, about a year, I, I was able to do what I was called to do. My point being is this, I'm glad that I had the grace to stay where I was until I was given permission to leave. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. Be careful about hasty moves, okay? All right, so the location, he's in the right place. Then we've got what I call providential oil. This is going to look at Esther for a second. I use the word oil a lot. Oil is a big symbolic kind of concept that I carry with me all the time. Oil speaks of anointing. Oil speaks of consecration. Oil speaks of God's uh, favor on something that helps it to move like it's supposed to move. And we see some oil of providence here working through Esther in verse 20. It says, now Esther's the queen of the land. Remember, she's the most powerful woman in all of the Persian empire. And it says she had not made known her kindred or her people. In other words, she didn't tell anybody that she was a Jew living in um, an Arab land. Why did she do that? Because Mordecai had commanded her. Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. Now, I want you to get this with me. So Esther's the queen. She's been promoted. She's been elevated. She won the Miss Persia contest and immediately becomes a multi-billionaire, is married to the most powerful man. She's got servants. She's got all everything you can think of as far as elegance and material goods. She's got the best wardrobe, the best makeup, the best attendees. She's got, she got, she's got whatever she wants. God had elevated her by his providence, had elevated her from orphanhood and loss into this wonderful place 
But here's the beauty of Esther. It's not just, the Bible speaks of her physical beauty, but here's where you see kind of her, her character, her beautiful character. She's the elevated queen of the Persian empire and she's still looking to Mordecai to lead her. She's still looking to Mordecai. Listen, anybody can be humble before you're exalted. The true test of your character is what, what happens to you when you are blessed and highly favored. What happens to you when you're not having to depend on God for all the material stuff, all the temporary stuff? What happens to you when you get your breakthrough? Does it change you? And for Esther, she's got this oil all over her. And the Bible says that even when she was the queen and nobody, quite frankly, could touch her at this point, there wasn't a clear anti-Semitic, anti-Hebrew, anti-Jewish uh, demonic assault yet. It's coming in just a chapter or two. But at this point, Esther could go in and say to her husband, the king, by the way, I was, I'm actually a Jew. I'm not even Persian. And Mordecai said, when you get in there, don't tell anybody that you are Jewish. And the Bible says she obeyed him just as she did when he was bringing her up. Now, let me tell you why I'm calling this oil because there's something here. And again, this, this, this is teaching. This can help you. What is the oil that I'm talking about? It's her obedience and faithfulness to authority in her life. People don't like this in our day. People do not like the concept of any kind of authority in our day. We all want to be free range kind of individuals. We want to be mavericks. We want to be people that don't, don't have to answer, aren't accountable. I got the Holy Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit. I don't need you to tell me what to do. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not responsible. Happens in our homes. People, you know, I think the older you are, the more you're probably at least accustomed to hearing that God has ordained authority in the home and people don't want to hear that anymore. And then authority in the civic arena, like you got to obey the cops, even though you don't know that if, which ones are like for you and which ones might be against you. The, the, the concept is we have to obey the authority in the land. And the Bible tells us quite a bit about honoring and obeying authority. As a matter of fact, to children, the, the only command specifically given to children in the New Testament is honor and obey your parents and it'll be well with you. That's the only thing. God could have said a thousand moral you know, commandments to them, but he just said, if you'll master honoring and obeying the authority in the home at a young age, that's going to set you on a really good track. And when we we're looking at this, I love the fact that though she was now more powerful in position than cousin Mordecai, she still said, he's been good to me. She said, I've trusted him my whole life. And if he tells me not to tell the king or anybody else that I'm a Hebrew, then I'm going to do it. So I don't know where your attitude is in these days, but I'm always up for an attitude check. Um, I think we need to hit this because God has a lot to say in his word about the authority in our lives. Again, there's designated authority in the home. If you're a two parent, a husband and a wife in the home, the husband is the head of that home. And he's going to give an answer to God for how he led that home. He's supposed to love his wife like Jesus loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? He laid down everything. He laid down everything for the betterment of his bride. God says that comes with headship. Headship is not strutting around, bless God, I'm the man, do what I tell you to do, because the Bible tells you, woman, to submit. You, you've missed the heart of Jesus if that's your attitude. Headship is more about using your authority, your, your, your um, God-given role in order to bless and better those that are underneath your authority. That's every sector of society. If there's not a husband or a dad in the home, then it's the mom. The, the rebellion that comes so often against single moms by their children violates the commandment of God. And so when we're looking at these things, you know, people hate the word submit because it's been misused and abused. But let me give you something. You never evaluate the credibility of a doctrine based on how somebody abused it. Every true doctrine has been abused. If, we, if, if our escape route is, well, I ain't doing that because that, that, that submission, that authority thing has been abused before, I'm not doing that. Well, everything in life has been abused somewhere by somebody. Every teaching in the scripture has been abused by somebody. And what God says is, you're actually submitting unto me through human authority. 
And it's not easy to do. I mean, I don't think anybody wakes up and says, I just want to submit. I just want to submit. Let me, who can I submit to? It's just not in the flesh. But when you do it as under the Lord, it actually does become a part of your instincts and the Lord rewires you. Um, I would say this, and I I don't know of any issues in the room, but one of the things that will empower a man in the home is when he knows he's honored and respected. You know, we're releasing this message on Valentine's Day, and what, what a lot of psychologists will tell you is that most men would rather be respected than loved. Women are like, what? I remember the book, Love and Respect. You ought to get it. It's by, I forget his name, Egerich is his last name, I think. And I remember when me and Amy read that book together, I'm reading the part on what she needs. I'm like, I am blowing it. I am messing up all over the place. And then when she read the part that was about what I needed, she's like, I don't know how to do it. Well, that's weird. Why are y'all like that? You know, why are men like that? Like, I don't know. But what, what makes a man thrive is to know that he's honored and respected in his home. And Esther, of course, was not married to Mordecai, but he had earned her respect. That's another word for the husbands and the dads. Like, you, it takes a while to earn it sometimes, but it don't take long to lose it. And so we've got to be like Jesus. And so it's the same thing in our schools. Some of you work in the school system and you see outright rebellion as you're working in the school system now that when you were a student in school, like you never would have done the stuff that they're doing to teachers and coaches and administrators now. What happened? Well, the whole breakdown in the culture where there is no respect of authority, there is no acknowledgement of honor. And now we've got a generation that in that, in that particular way really need the gospel to come to life in them Because I'm going to tell you something, if you don't obey your parents, you will likely not obey your teachers, then you will not likely obey the law of the land, and ultimately you won't have any interest in obeying God. So God says, I'm going to train you as a child in the home, obey and honor and respect the authority that I've placed in your life. And God is always gauging how we're responding. You know, it is an election year. And uh, some of y'all are going to get like all clenched up in November and you're going to have your guard up and you're going to be feasting on CNN and Fox News and talk radio and all that stuff. And you're going to be unhappy. I'll just go ahead and prophesy that. You're going to be unhappy because you're going to take into you all of the anger. And this is what the Bible ultimately tells us. The Bible speaks to us and tells us in Romans 13, 1 and 2, foundational verses, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that that exist, those authorities that exist, have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. So I really hope all of you, like, I'm a conservative. I don't mind telling you that. Like, you don't have to be, but I am a conservative. I believe in law and order. I believe in biblical morality. I believe in the sanctity of life. I believe in biblical definitions of manhood, womanhood, and sexuality. I believe that my government's responsibility is to protect this nation and securing our borders. I believe also that we have a responsibility on some level to take care of the poor and the needy, but we have to be able to differentiate between who's poor and needy and who's coming over here to blow stuff up. And so, yes, I am a conservative, but I'm going to tell you, my fellow conservatives, you've been sinning if you have been railing against the president verbally online. You've been sinning. Why? Because God says that he put President Biden in office. That doesn't mean he endorses his policies. He put President Trump in office. Doesn't mean he endorses President Trump's character. It just means when God gives a nation a president, it's what we deserve. And when we're railing against authority, the Bible says, this isn't me, I'm I'm repeating it, but the Bible says when you resist God-appointed authority, you are resisting God. And that ought to make us slow to speak and swift to hear. (sighs) Esther was still obeying Mordecai's authority. And that's the oil. Her trusting obedience was the oil that God would use to take us further into her story. Verse 21, here comes the providential timing. This has got God all over it. 
It says, in those days, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. And as he's just sitting there, Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, that means they were servants who were emasculated, so they wouldn't be a threat to any of the women. And these two guys, they're upset, they're mad. They're eunuchs, they probably should be upset and mad, but they're, they're guarding the threshold, and they became angry, and they sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So these two guys are talking. And as they're talking, you get two bitter people talking. What starts out as an irritation ends up becoming a plan to assassinate the king of Persia. And Mordecai is somewhere, either they don't think that he can understand them or they don't see him or he's somehow kind of veiled and covered, but he's hearing a legitimate assassination plot against the king. Um, think about this. It's another, it's another moment. I really didn't intend on this being the major theme, but I'm, I think maybe Holy Spirit wants us to focus on this. Here we have, again, rebellion against government, rebellion against authority. Big Than and Teresh are rebelling against the king. By the way, it's not just the government. It's actually their vocational authority. He's their boss. Whew, you want to get people in trouble. Listen, you want to get convicted? How, you, how are you talking about your boss? How are you representing those that pay your check? How do you, how do you respect the authority in the workplace? H raise your hand if you've ever worked for somebody that just tore you up in the wrong way. That's almost every employed person in the room. I'm going to tell you, I haven't worked directly for somebody. I do at the college. I have two delightful bosses, but I haven't worked for somebody in the marketplace in a long time, since 2002, uh, 2000 and no, since then. it's been a long time, 97 is when I came out of the workforce. And I failed miserably because every bad day I was having, it was my boss's fault. Every assignment I was given that I didn't want to do, it was somebody else's job, it was my boss's fault. Every time, and I remember as, as a Christian, a young Christian, verbalizing and just thinking, man, I'm above this stuff. I don't have to put up with stuff. I'm saved. I'm called to preach. I, I would never say it to them, but God heard my heart. And it's actually sin. Now, I didn't want to kill anybody. These two guys are going to kill their boss. But it's this issue of unchecked offense. Somewhere, the Bible just says that they were angry at the king and their solution is, we're going to kill him. Do you remember what Jesus said? That if you have anger in your heart towards another person, you're committing spiritual murder. And that's why we're told constantly, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You have to deal with your junk towards people because an unchecked seed of bitterness becomes a garden of bitterness. And the fruit that comes from a garden of bitterness is usually death. It may not be physical death, but relationships are killed. Opportunities are killed. Joy is killed. Peace is killed. A lot of people in the church don't have joy in their life because they're bitter at their boss or they're bitter at their spouse or they're bitter at their pastor or they're bitter you know, somewhere and they haven't done anything about it. If you don't get that out of there, the wage of that unchecked bitterness will result in something dying. And so here are these guys. But the point of this is the providential hand of God made sure Mordecai overheard the conversation. This attaches somewhat to you being in the right place. You need to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Like some of us, I'm a little OCD about promptness. I'm like, if I'm supposed to be there at 9 a.m., I'm not going to be there at 9.01. Why? Because I'm supposed to be there at 9. I, I'm not, matter of fact, I'm not going to be there at nine. I'm going to be there at a quarter tail or 20 tail. Drives my wife nuts. I'm that guy. I'm like, you know, she's in there getting ready and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm like, uh, we, we need to go. By the way, that never speeds things up. Ladies, you know, it's true. It's like, oh, he's pacing the floor telling me we need to go. I think I'll just take a little bit longer. And what she'll usually tell me, she'll usually say, Jeff, we've got 30 minutes and it takes 10 minutes to get there. And I give her 15 things that might happen in between here, there and here. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? And we might be late because my nightmare in life is to not be where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. 
Now that may be a little over the top and I've gotten plenty of therapy and counseling for other things. That might be the next. But my point being is this. Um, if you'll just master the commitment to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there, that produces oil. For me, for me to be late all the time communicates to whoever is meeting me there at that time or expecting me there. It communicates to them, you're not important to me. I'm more important to me. You're not important. You're not important. You can wait on me. And in those, in those disciplines, you know, we've got to get a return a little bit to a soldier mentality in the church. We've been on a playground for so long in the kingdom and now it's turning into a battleground and people are showing up to the battleground with a picnic basket at whatever time they want to show up. Now, you may think I'm stretching things a little bit here, but I'm telling you, if Mordecai hadn't been in the gate like he was supposed to be that day, he wouldn't have heard the conversation that he heard that day. And this conversation that he heard that day is going to eventually lead to the deliverance of all of the people of Israel. And it takes faith and humility just to say, I'm going to be faithful to what I know I'm supposed to do. It may seem boring. I may have been faithful in this thing for a thousand days beforehand and no big Esther-like event happened in my life. Just keep being where you're supposed to be and doing it at the time you're supposed to do it, okay? All right, verse 22. This is what I call providential connections. God brings the right people together. So these guys are planning the assault and it comes to the knowledge of Mordecai. So he tells Queen Esther, Esther tells the kings in the, the king in the name of Mordecai. Okay, so what you've got there is you've got divine connection. King Ahasuerus probably didn't have the luxury right then of putting all the dots together, connecting all the dots. But his wife was the cousin, young cousin, raised by the guy who overheard the assassination plot. Think about this. If you're a Jew living in a pagan land and you're basically indentured servants, you're basically slaves. They're living in a land where they were brought in captivity, captives of war. Some people would be like, oh, the king's going to get assassinated? Well, that's probably the Lord paying him back for what he did to me. And taking that bitterness and just saying, I've got some really intense information, but I'm not going to use it for the good of another because I'm struggling in this place and he's the king over it. He's the authority over it. What has he ever done for me? Like those conversations can happen inside an unhealthy person's spirit. And, and it doesn't have to be Esther and Mordecai. It can happen with us. You know, isn't it amazing that Jesus tells us, hey, I want you to pray for your enemies and bless them. If you can do that, and you can, by the way, and you must, by the way, and like you'll have plenty of opportunity to do it if you're living for Jesus, you're going to make some enemies. But if you can do that, you will graduate to the place where bitterness has zero entrance into your life. If the one that hurt you the most deeply, that you can pray for them and you can bless them and you can enter into the process of the Lord helping you with that, you're going to get so straight up free from these things. Mordecai somehow and Esther, they were free from the bitterness. And uh, Mordecai takes this information. He's connected to Esther. Esther's connected to the king. And beautifully, God is providentially working to spare this pagan king his very life. Who's God providentially connected you to? Who are the people in your life right now? I get excited when I meet new people. Um, I, especially in the role that I have in a church, when, when I see God sending new people, let's just keep it home base, to this house, I, I always wonder why of all the places in Bible Belt Land, USA, like we could probably, a, a strong quarterback could probably hit two or three churches standing in the front yard with a football because we have churches all around. Why would God send somebody here? I look at this assembly and we're coming up, I think three years in a couple of weeks, um, for Sunday in March, something like that. we be three years and I'm looking at like, most of us weren't here three years ago. And most of us have had moments like, wh why am I here? Why did God send me and all these people to, you know, a, a church 
a little bit in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's grown and everything. But, but why did he send us here? And you have to pay attention to that. Why are you working with the people you're working with? Why are you in the family that you're in the family? God could have birthed you all sorts of different types of kids, but he gave you the type of children that he gave you on purpose because he's wise and he knows you're the right parents for them and that they are the right children for you to work his purposes in both of your, your individual lives. And so when we're looking at this, I'm always thinking to myself, God doesn't do anything accidentally. And so one of the things that you ought to be asking if God has sent you here is be asking a question, why? Like, why? What does the Lord have in this season in your life of why you're here at Antioch Outpost? What does he want to give you? What does he want you to release? Who does he want you to connect with? Um, I think of our precious friend Tanya and our wonderful brother Don. I knew Don Patal at another church years ago. And when I came here, Tanya was working here. So she predated me here. And then Don, man, I'm just feeling all Esther-like here. Don, because he knew me, said, I'm going to go give uh, that church a try where Jeff's now the pastor. Don comes up here, gets engaged in a presence ministry. Well, Tanya's part of that ministry. And then all of a sudden, those two single adults meet each other, and we got a wedding coming in April. Like, to me, man, that like, n- nobody tried to make that happen. Nobody, Don didn't come up here saying, I'm going to find me a woman up there at Antioch Outpost. I'm going to get me a girl. And Tanya wasn't waiting at the front door being the leader of greeters scanning the horizon. Where is an eligible male? You know, I mean, I'm just, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking to myself, that's the hand of God. That is the hand of the Lord. And if you'll start thinking like that, you'll start realizing there really aren't accidents. And even if something's unplanned and even if something is difficult, the God who is sovereign works through normal decisions that we make in life to bring about our provid- his providential care in our life. And in this case, um, he had the right guy at the gate. He had the right woman married to the king in the palace and they're gonna take care of business. So let's get this last point and we'll get ready to go. It's this providential detail. God here plants something that later is gonna grow. So look in verse number 23, this providential detail. When the affair, that's the murder plot, when the murder plot was investigated, and found to be so. So you know there was a moment where some of the king's staff said, hey, big fan, Teresh, get in here. We got to talk to you about something. We've heard a report. Came from some guy named Mordecai. I don't even know who he is, but we need to ask you. And they did their investigation. And it says, and they found it to be true. These two men were hanged on the gallows. And... Dun, dun, dun. It was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. All right, just pause for a minute. I'm going to give you kind of a uh, spoiler alert here. That book that they wrote down on this date, Mordecai gave a report that staff members Big Fan and Teresh plotted to kill King Ahasuerus. The report from the man named Mordecai was investigated and found to be true. He saved the king's life. Big Than and Teresh were executed immediately. That goes in the ledger. Somebody takes that ledger when all the other pages are filled and sticks it up on a shelf. Just remember that because it's going to come off the shelf here in a little while. Not tonight, but in a little while. So I want you to think about this. Mordecai just reported a crime being planned. Esther just told her husband like she should have done. They're being where they should be and doing what they should do. The investigators did what they were supposed to do, where they were supposed to be, doing what they were supposed to do. Investigation, the human element takes place, finds out these guys are guilty. Says they were hanged on the gallows. That's not the last time you're going to see gallows in the book of Esther. Let me tell you something. When I read that, I think of of hangings. It's not what that is. It's literally a metal or a wooden sharpened spike that is built on a raised platform and they impaled Big Fan and Teresh on the spike and let them be for public display as a warning to everybody, don't mess with the king. And so it, it was the demise of these two murderers for hire, but it all got chronicled and it all got 
I mean, it's a little record-keeping entry. It's just this little thing, but it proves later to be one of the most major factors in the story of Esther. So I would love to tell you, here's nine things you can do with this message. I'm not trying to get you to do anything except maybe this. Slow down and pay attention to what's going on in your life. Pay attention to the people that God is removing from your life. Listen, a lot. <clears throat> this helps me so much. Um, abandoned as a child, my mom left me. It was the biggest wound. It was the thing that kept me bitter at God and bitter at people. So I had an orphan spirit forever. I mean, even it, well into my Christian years, had an orphan spirit. I hated it when people left. And then going through some deliverance and some counseling and just listening to wiser people, I realized, <clears throat> newsflash, it's actually good when some people leave your life. It's actually helpful. And God knows who to leave in your life and who to remove in your life. And some people are removed from your life, even painfully, by the providential hand of God because they can't go, where, they can't go with you where he's calling you to go. So pay attention when he removes somebody. Pay attention when he brings somebody into your life. Listen, be who you're supposed to be. You're living in a rock star, neon flashing, LCD screen culture. And your life's not supposed to be like that. Your life, most of us, the vast majority of Americans are actually supposed to have fairly simple lives that probably won't shake the world. Most of you aren't going to, you know, win the big whatever that's out there now. I don't even watch that stuff anymore. It used to be when I was real little Star Search, then it was American Idol, then it's X Factor and all that stuff. You're not going to win that. You're okay. Listen, brothers, you're probably not going to be the wealthiest, the wealthiest, and the most successful, and the handsomest, and have the best car, and the nicest house. You're probably not going to have that. Ladies, you're not going to be the, God help me, I don't want to get in trouble, but you're not going to be, you're not going to, like, you, it's okay if you're not a size three. It's really okay. It's okay if your hair doesn't look like whatever hair is supposed to look like on Instagram. It, it's okay if you don't have, uh, you know, all of the, 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 women just get so smacked down by the, the idolization of the American version of beauty and it just, it crushes women because they let that junk get in their spirit and they forget that God says, I actually made you wonderfully and fearfully. I like the way I made you. God made me short. Waffle fries made me wide. <laughs> but God made me short. I hated that growing up, man. It's hard to be the short kid. But that's the way the Lord made me. And so you just get to a point where you're like, okay, I don't need to be going for the fake stuff that they put and dangle in front of us to tell us this is what makes a happy life. Those people aren't happy anyway, by the way. They're like, because all that stuff they're putting the stock in. Man, I've seen some of those like people in their 70s and 80s and they had all that work done. I'm like, is that a man or a woman or a mannequin or a alien? I'm like, what, what in the world did you do? What happened? They were chasing something that you can't keep. And I'm thinking there's so much in front of us and around us. And the simple life is underrated. Like find somebody to love. Work hard at what you've been given to do. Cease from comparing your status with the status of somebody else. And just ask God what he thinks about how you're living. Look at the people around you and refuse to take them for granted. Recognize he connects us in certain seasons with certain people and we're to treasure them and reveal Jesus to them. And when you lay your head down tonight, I feel so pastoral right now. When you lay your head down tonight, I just dare you to be content. I just dare you to say, you know, like, yeah, I don't know why I've been wrestling in my soul over so much that's not yet a reality in my life. And Lord, instead of doing that tonight, I'm going to just say thank you. Remember the old gospel song? I don't, I'm not going to sing it, but it was some of us that are older remember it. But I got a roof over my head. I got shoes on my feet. I've said I wasn't going to sing it, so I'm not. But, 
But it, it's, you know, I hated the song back in the day because it was just hokey. But now, <laughs> as an old man, <laughs> now I'm like, yeah, that's actually right. I think there's some wisdom in that. Um, I'll give you this nugget and then we're going to go home. Matter of fact, stand to your feet. You've heard about the rat race, right? The rat race. Here's the thing. Even if you win it, you're still a rat. That's not for you. Like, love well. Exhale. You're not at the finish line yet. He's still working. He's providentially working. Like, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't bow down over heaven and say, let me take a day and explain to you everything I'm doing in your life. This is what he says. He, he, he literally looks at you and says, have I been good to you? Yes, Lord, you've been good to me. Any reason why you think that I legitimately won't be good to you moving forward? No, Lord, I'm just worried about this and this. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, I didn't tell you, but I'll just let you know. I'm well aware of that thing that you're struggling with. I got you. I want you to be where you're supposed to be, be who you're supposed to be, be there when you're supposed to be there. Do faithful obedience, honor authority, love well, and I'm going to providentially guide you into the exact place that I've got for you. Sound okay? All right.